could say, just can't find a way. You are a rainbow in our Access to the internet is the basic global communications network today. It's the replacement for the telephone. And for people all over the world, having access to the internet makes it possible for them to get access to markets that are far away, uh, work with their friends on very creative new businesses, get rid of gatekeepers of all kinds, intermediaries who otherwise would be responsible for publishing things and taking a long time to take a slice off the top of whatever new business or new idea you had. All of that is gone, as is the, all the borders around the world for the internet. So it's a, the internet is the most empowering development of my lifetime. It's the most exciting thing. Internet access is the centerpiece for 21st century life right now. But what the engineers didn't even imagine when they came up with the internet protocols was that the people who provide us with internet access, the telephone companies, would ever have a say in who gets access to the internet, uh, what they get to do while they're using the internet, how much they have to pay for internet access. They, had, they would never have imagined that. In fact, the people, the guy who invented packet switching, Paul Baran, tells this famous story that he took the idea of packet switching to AT&T just to let them know about it. And they said, son, that's not how a network works. Because for the phone company, the only kind of communication that makes sense is one that's completely controlled from the end point to the end point. So there's a dedicated circuit, and they're able to charge perfectly for it, whatever they want to. They couldn't imagine that packets could make their own way around the world. Well, what happened about 10 years ago is that the telephone companies and everybody else providing internet access woke up. They woke up and they said, how is it that all these new businesses are being formed using our lines? That doesn't make sense. And so they came up with this story, which is that uh, we won't build high capacity pipes for people to access the internet unless you let us discriminate you know, choose which communications do well and which do badly. Let us decide what neighborhoods to serve so that we get to charge rich people a lot of money for internet access and leave out the poor. They made a deal with our government here in the United States that was, you deregulate us, lift all kinds of obligations from us, and we will in exchange build internet access for you. Well, the first part has certainly happened. We got rid of all the rules. They can cherry pick neighborhoods, they can decide who gets what service. The second part hasn't. So there are 100 million Americans who still don't have internet access. And for rich people, it's getting more and more expensive and there are local monopolies that I'd love to talk about that control wired internet access. And for poor people, there's often no access at all. So unlike water and electricity and the postal service, for which we have a public option. We have the idea that all Americans should have access to these things. We don't have that at all for internet access. It's a purely private product. It's like going to a first run movie. It's expensive and it's rare. For a telephone conversation, the telephone company isn't allowed to charge you based on how interesting your conversation is or how much money you've made during the course of that conversation. And that's because we had this idea that telephone networks are public goods, that they make possible so many good things for society, that if we allow one private company to appropriate all the value from it, that actually will undermine the social fabric for the entire country. So we regulated the telephone companies and said, no, you don't get to choose conversations. You just charge a basic rate for connectivity, and that's it. Here's another mental picture, which is uh, imagine a river just water rolling by a village, and everybody gets to dip into the river and take what's of value to them and use it for making cakes and doing all kinds of other things. For internet access, it's as if we've let a few companies build enormous dams and flywheels, water mills, and they're making all the money off of that rushing river, and the rest of us are left without. it is a big political issue yet. I think it will be. I okay. think it will be. And I have great hopes that especially our students will take this on as a central political issue. Everybody should be elected to Congress based on whether or not 
they understand the importance of this utility to American life. Right now, it's not even brought up in debates. It's not part of the political conversation. Uh, the centrality of the internet, you know, the necessity of it to be inexpensive. It's not even relevant. Or, and that's because, the, well, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so, uh, but, but although at the same time, SOAP and PIPA were an example of an issue in which many congressmen changed their decision very right. quickly, which I don't know if I could name many other examples that would have such an ability of changing, you know, the, 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 the decision of congressmen. So that's why I was saying uh, an issue that now is, is becoming more important that, that is, is starting to show their way that maybe, maybe I agree with you that maybe in, in the higher spheres is not recognized right. as an important political issue, mm -hmm. but among the citizens, would you say that maybe it is recognized or is becoming recognized? Well, there's not much awareness yet of how much power the local carriers have and how few carriers we're depending on for internet access and how much they're gouging us. And Americans are not quite aware of how much better internet access is in the rest of the world. We're not a curious country for some reason. We don't care how good life is in South Korea or Japan or the Netherlands. If we could bring that picture home and help people recognize for internet access what they're missing, how much better things could be, then I think even uh, other generations among, you know, beyond the very young people would understand how central this is. Sopa Pipa, I hope, was a great turning point for this kind of issue in that it indicates that there are a lot of young people who are galvanized by any attack on the internet. The problem with internet access as an issue is that it's so incremental. There's no sharp crisis. There's no moment where you say, oh my god, the, the world's falling apart. It's just bad. It's like global warming as an issue. We know the summers are getting warmer. We know that humans are contributing to this. But it's hard to visualize it. It's hard to understand how any one person's actions could ever have an impact on it. And we're in the same situation right now with internet access. There's a little bit of it in the United States. For rich people, there's quite a lot. And yet it's not visible yet as an access issue. So issues that are very classic and we would immediately know what is the stereotypical response of, you know, the GOP yeah. or of the Democrat. Right. You know, so for example, we say, well, you know, GOP would be, you know, pro-life, Democrats would be pro-choice. You know, right. that's, you know, very, very stereotypical response. Now, when it would come to internet access or when it comes to like net neutrality, what, how do you see those lining up? Because maybe we're not yet sure what are the positions of you know, and I was wondering if you had any, any at, at this point, would be predictions, you know, of how would you say that they would align? Oh, it's a great question. I think uh, right now we see the GOP lining up with um, AT&T and Comcast because they're very well paid, frankly, by the carriers. But there's a historical story here that indicates that this is actually a bipartisan issue. At one point in 1904, let's say, 1902, both very progressive farmers and Rockford Republicans were furious at the railroads and furious at other privately controlled utilities that were dictating the terms on which the free market could operate. So if you're a farmer and a railroad is not regulated and can charge you whatever it wants to, to let you get your goods to market, or if you're a Republican sitting in New Jersey who wants to be able to turn on a light switch and is being gouged by the local utility, both those groups can be angry. And at about that point in the early 20th century, we had a tremendous progressive awakening as both the left and the right, for their own reasons, recognized that their world was being controlled by these giant com providers of commodities. And they actually rose up and elected Teddy Roosevelt. He actually comes into office in 1901. And they go after the railroads and Standard Oil and the light utilities and the, everybody else saying, no, no, you've got to serve the public. You're a monopoly provider of a commodity service. Fast forward now, I do think that eventually, I hope, the Republicans will recognize that this is a free market issue. That if you don't have a predictable low transaction cost network to address with your business, you're actually cutting down on the market that you could reach with your thing. And just because a few companies are now reaping enormous rewards by monetizing access, that's not good for you, the small business or another actor who would like to have a reliable sidewalk on which
Well, we, we're at this very interesting moment around the world where the old copper wire phone networks are reaching the end of their useful life, and they don't carry enough bandwidth for internet access to be capable of carrying video and making you know, lots of real-time interactions possible. So other countries around the world have said, oh, we need to replace that copper with fiber, with fiber optics that have essentially unlimited capacity for all kinds of human interactions online. So they've made that choice as a matter of industrial policy. They just say, look, we needed clean water, we needed electricity, now we need fiber. And that's happening all over Asia. So China has decided that 300 million Chinese people are going to have access to fiber in their homes by 2015. That's a very ambitious agenda, and probably it's only because they're an authoritarian country they can make it happen. But even in democracies like Japan, South Korea, Netherlands, it's a choice by the government to make sure that their citizens are able to participate as effectively as possible in the economy. The story that may make Americans pay attention is Australia. They're a lot like Americans. They drink a lot of beer, they're cheerful, you know. They play a weird sport. They play some weird sports, <laughs> and, and we, we understand each other. And the government of Australia has decided that 93% of Australians are going to have fiber to the home. And the government's funding it. They're making sure that there's a basic fiber network connecting everybody in place of that old copper foam wire. And if they can do it, that's a big blank country. There are a lot of you know, holes in the middle of Australia. Surely the United States, which should be number one in internet access, should be able to have this series of thoughts. It's an essential utility. We made a mistake by deregulating it. We've got these monopolies now that are controlling access. We've got to take a different approach because we're falling behind. We won't be the place where the new Google, the new thing that requires instantaneous real-time human interaction online, is going to be developed. It's not going to happen here because there won't be a big enough market inside America for those things to be tested. The first steps luckily are upon us. There's a crisis, which is that already four states in the United States have decided not to provide phone access to absolutely everybody in the state. They've said, oh, there's a competitive market. Um, we don't need to make sure that the poorest in our state actually have a phone. They'll get cell phone access, they'll pay for this somehow. This is a disaster because there are a lot of elderly people, people in rural areas, poor people who only have landline phone and don't want to have to pay for some private service that doesn't guarantee them access to public safety. You know, right now using a landline you can reach 911 easily, right? And you can always be connected to the rest of the world. Imagine giving up on part of your citizens in a state. This gives us, this crisis gives us an opportunity to say, all right, we're getting rid of the social contract for communications. How can we do that? And to help everybody understand that the next network, the basic network, is fiber access to the home. And that we should be making sure that every American has that at a reasonable cost. So I'm hoping that the first step is, oh my goodness, we're leaving Americans behind. Second step is, and wow, it's really expensive. Why is it so expensive? I'm paying more and more and more for cable service. Third step is, people are going to recognize that the phone companies have gotten out of the business of taking care of wires and providing internet access. That really, we've got a cable monopoly in 22 out of 25, the largest American cities. There's one company providing cable access. And they can charge whatever they want. No one tells them what they're doing. So when people realize that cable is now in charge, they already hate the cable companies for lots of reasons. They're very expensive. Then they get upset, and they start electing people on this basis, saying, we've really got to rework this. We've got to rethink what it means to be one country. We can't be getting rid of our phone system, our postal system. What's next? Water? What's next? Public schooling? Electricity? And we'll have a change in mindset that's going to happen over the next few years. Food is not a natural monopoly, so let me explain how this works. What's interesting about telecommunication systems, just like water and electricity, is that it costs an awful lot to build them initially, right? So it really only makes sense to have one of them in each community. You don't have two water systems 
They don't have two electrical systems. There's one provider. But you have 100 restaurants, they exactly. They have 100 restaurants, and they all survive because the barriers to entry, that's why the economic guys would talk about it. Lots of people can enter to compete. With this kind of commodity thing, like water, electricity, telecommunications, it doesn't make sense to have a lot of competitors. It actually is only fruitful for one actor to show up. And the companies know this, and so what they've been doing is consolidating because it is so expensive to try to compete. They've given up competing and they've just consolidated. And so we have all the downsides of the natural monopoly, which is one actor in each community providing us with wired access, and none of the oversight of that monopoly. No regulation, no consumer protection, no requirement that it be provided on a, you know, for a fair price or a reasonable price around the country. So it's a very different, these natural monopolies with high upfront costs, it, it costs very little to serve one additional customer. So it actually makes sense for them to have enormous scale. So that's, they're, they're very, very large companies, very expensive to build, almost impossible to compete. And yet we're treating them like a normal market actor, which makes no sense. So let so let, let's move now away from the electrons and yeah. away from the photons and into the bits, yeah. you know? Because obviously the internet also has kind of like this, this, this non-physical side and we have been talking mostly about the physical side. And, and let me tell you a story that I heard not so long ago from, from a very good and reliable source in which uh, a good friend of mine was talking with uh, someone and I'm not gonna name names, so I'm gonna say that, you know, someone that was head of search at an important search engine. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about, you know, search at another even more important search engine. Yeah. Okay? And one of the things that they say is like, you know what? You know what the problem is for us is that even if we would have exactly the same algorithms than this other more superior search engine, we wouldn't have the data that we would be required to train those algorithms in order to provide the same search results. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, we're never gonna be able to compete and at that level because you know, there is an advantage that is all of the data has been accumulated prior, you know, and that would be required to provide, you know, like the good search results that are needed. Yeah. So now we also see that maybe would that be a natural monopoly? Do we have monopolies that are emerging also on the side of the bits rather than on the side of the atoms? It's a great question. I tend to treat the sidewalk and the conversation above the sidewalk as two very different things because the, I, when you're sitting in your living room, you can only get access to the physical wire that's coming into your house. When you're sitting in front of a screen, you can click over to another search engine. The switching costs are invisible. Yeah, but um, if the other one cannot provide you an inferior service, uh, sorry, a an, an, uh, comparable service, yeah. because it doesn't have access to a resource that is private and, and cannot be, you know, so there's a barrier to entry that is infinite because, you know, there's something that is. Yeah, I yeah. Find that's for me harder to conceptualize because that data could be gathered by the second competing search engine. If you have the volume, but in order to have the volume, volume. has to have the quality. So there is a chicken right. and egg. It, it was, it's a chicken and egg thing, but also they could be building relationships with all kinds of other actors who could give them access to data and a better algorithm. I used Alta Vista for a long time, and then I switched to other search engines. It cannot be that the search engines are not going to be knocked off their perch. So, so you, you would argue years. that in general they cannot be natural monopolies on the bit side, even no. if it's a social network, even if it's you know, none of those. Well, there are network effects that are very difficult to overcome. And if you brought all your friends and all of your communications tools into you know, one or two baskets, maybe the switching costs then become higher. But I still believe that because it's physically easy to exit, these things are different in kind as well as in quality. That uh, there's a, the, the infrastructure barriers are so much higher than the bit barriers. I can imagine if the kids who started Diaspora at NYU are you know, persuasive, there are gonna be a lot of people who get freaked out by Facebook in the next few years who will exit, no matter how many friends they have tied up with that network, to go to another place that has similar affordances and a different list of people. They'll just leave. So for me, that means that Facebook and Google and Microsoft are all overturnable in time. could say, just can't find a way, you are a rainbow in our rainy day, the taste of your smile caresses my mind, even while you're out of my sight.